evening, everybody. Glad that you're here. Tonight, we're getting back to basics. So, I hear people all the time that say, Doc, it's just too darn complicated. One week, I hear that X, Y, or Z is good for me, and the next week, the new study comes out and it says that it's bad for me. And one friend is telling me this, and my uncle is telling me that, and I just have no idea where to even start. So tonight, rather than getting really involved in one particular health topic like we normally do, we're going to kind of do a, a foundational place to start as a response to questions that I get a lot from people that I run into. So we're going to try to keep it really simple and we're going to try to keep it really applicable. So we'll go ahead and jump right in. We're going to talk about five things. So you got five fingers, five things we need to remember. And you can think of them as the five pillars or your five foundational pieces, however you want to think about it. So, in summary, and kind of as a preview, first thing is, and this note, by the way, no particular order. You can prioritize them as you see fit. Number one, we got to detox our homes. Number two, we have to cook and we have to eat real food. And I'll explain that a little more in depth. Number three is pretty obvious, you got to get a little bit of exercise. No, you don't have to kill yourself doing CrossFit to be healthy. And so we're going to go over that and I'm going to give you some real easy ways to get going if you haven't done much exercising or if you're already an exercise fanatic then maybe after my talk you'll scale it back a little. Fourth thing is sleep. Sleep is vital to any healthy being. And we're going to talk about some ways to preserve your sleep, protect your sleep, and make sure that you're getting enough. Uh, number five, I think might be the most important, and it's not talked about a lot in medical circles, or really any, any circles in my experience, and that's a good spiritual foundation, a, a lens through which to view the world so that you can make sense of what's going on and what you run into. So that's the fifth. Uh, the sixth is kind of a bonus, and I'll talk about it a little bit at the <laughs> end, and that's chiropractic. Okay, this is a, a discipline that is really foreign to a lot of people. So, we'll go ahead and get, dive in a little deeper. We need to be a little more conscious of the chemicals that we run into day in and day out. So, in my opinion, our toxic burden for decades now as a society has been completely out of control and people are really excited about chemistry without understanding the negative effects that all these chemicals have on our health. So there are over 84,000 chemicals that are approved for use in the United States. Most of these chemicals were grandfathered in when the EPA came to, into existence. Uh, about 50 years ago. And so out of that 84,000, there's only been a couple thousand that have ever even been remotely studied for safety. So day in and day out, we are literally being used as guinea pigs because nobody's ever looked into whether or not these chemicals are harmful to people. And this is kind of a theme for me, but we, we really need to do something for ourselves. We cannot depend on uh, corporations, government entities, bureaucrats to solve this problem for us. We need to do it ourselves, in our own home, for ourselves and our families. So we can't wait for somebody to fix this. We just have to go ahead and do it. So as I mentioned, the toxic burden is out of control. I'm going to give you some tips for ways to, to bring that down a little bit. First, I want to tell you guys why this is important. You know, 
people think, oh yeah, you know, chemicals aren't that good for me, but everybody uses them, it's not a big deal. Well, toxic exposure and exposure to chemicals have been linked to all different kinds of diseases. Autoimmune conditions, cancer, asthma, allergies, autism, diabetes. Lots and lots of our modern day health challenges come from a toxic burden that's overwhelming the body from one source or another. Usually a combination of things. So this is really important and not many people are talking about what's driving this epidemic of chronic conditions in our country. A lot of people want to fix it and a lot of people want to complain about it but I don't hear a lot of conversation about why is this happening? Well, a big reason is we're just completely overloaded with chemicals. So, what do you do? How do you fix this? First thing, and if you only do one thing after my talk tonight, please let this be it. Buy a good water filter. We are mostly water. People know that water is vital to our existence. And it has to be clean. It has to be clean. If you have a good water filter, then you can be assured that you and your family are supplying yourselves with good, clean water that's going to refresh you and help to detoxify your body. When you think about the things that are in our tap water, it's, it's a little bit scary. So we have uh, fluoride, which they add in most places. El Paso is one of the few places in America that's naturally fluoridated. Uh, most places the municipality will add fluoride to the water. It's supposed to be good for your teeth. Um, it's really not. And it's a very potent neurotoxin. Also, one of the main ingredients in Prozac. Interestingly enough. Hmm. Wonder why. So that's uh, another discussion for another time. But I hope I can give you some food for thought. So it's not just fluoride. They are finding more and more uh, birth control byproducts in water supplies. They are finding chemicals from industry and uh, energy production. They are finding antidepressants in the water. Lots and lots of harmful substances that we don't want. And so the only way that you can be sure that you're getting clean water is to have a good filter. They don't have to be incredibly expensive. Myself, I purchased a Berkey filter. It's gravity fed. It's under $300. And the water that comes out works out to about two cents a gallon. So it's very affordable. Uh, I'm not sure how much you paid for the last bottle of water that you drank, but it's probably way more than two cents. Um, this is an important thing, and we're talking about our own health, and that's what this talk is about, but when you think about the health of our planet and the health of our environment, we're drowning in plastic as a planet. So bottled water I save for uh, times when you really need convenience, when you're traveling, when you're going here and there, but day in and day out, I think a good water filter is the way to go, all around. So that's the number one thing to detox your home. Detox your water. Uh, by the way, a shower filter is also a good idea because anything that touches your skin is absorbed into the bloodstream and a 10 minute shower in warm water is equivalent to drinking almost a gallon of whatever water you're bathing in. So shower filters are not expensive. They're about 60 bucks for a good one. They last you a year and you'll be able to notice the difference right away. Uh, the shower won't smell like a chlorine gas chamber and your skin and hair will be soft too. So, gotta clean up our water. We gotta clean up our cleaners. All these chemical products, Lysol, bleach, Purell, I mean the list goes on and on. Very, very harsh chemicals. And if you are Sorry about that. If you're cleaning weekly, 
maybe daily, if you're one of those people, at least monthly, I hope, <laughs> then you're being exposed to these really harsh chemicals on a regular basis. I know that when I used to clean with harsh chemicals, I never wore gloves. I never wore a respirator. You don't think about it. You go in, you clean your bathroom, you're done. This is a, a real, consistent source of chemical exposure. So we've got to clean up our cleaners. Vinegar will kill almost anything. Baking soda will polish almost anything. You can use uh, lemons. You can use some essential oils. Uh, many hospitals in Europe and other parts of the world are using essential oils to disinfect their spaces. And I think it's a fantastic practice. So there are lots of human and animal friendly options. You just have to do a little digging, but my advice is start with distilled white vinegar. You can, you can clean almost anything with that. We need to clean up our hygiene products. So a lot of chemicals are absorbed through our skin, through the hygiene products that we're applying every day, maybe more than once a day. So some of the really big ones, you don't want aluminum in your deodorant. It's a very common ingredient in deodorant and it's a potent neurotoxin that you're applying basically straight into your lymphatic system every day. Not to mention all the scents and all the colors and dyes and I mean the list goes on and on. Some of these things when you start to understand what the ingredients do and what they're used for, it's amazing to me that they're even allowed to be used on humans or, or any living thing. They're really toxic. So what if they smell good? So what if you smell good? You're poisoning yourself every day. You don't have to smell like a dirty hippie to do this. <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be uh, a one side or the other completely. There are lots of really human friendly hygiene products that work very well. Uh, if anybody has questions about that in, in particular, then you can reach out to me. But thankfully, we're seeing more and more friendly hygiene products available on the market. Some of these you can even get at Walmart. So it doesn't have to be really hard or expensive. It just has to be friendly to us. So aluminum and deodorant is probably the number one thing. Um, also, we got to quit using antibacterial soaps and antibacterial body washes. Uh, so when I gave my gut microbiome lecture not too long ago, I dived very deeply into the diverse and incredible world of bacteria. They live on our skin, they live in our bodies, they live all around us. And for the most part, they're our friends and we don't need to just bomb the heck out of them and wipe them off the face of the earth. We depend on these guys and we don't need super bugs. Yes, we need to be healthy and we need to take care of ourselves. No, we don't need to wage war on the microbes because we're gonna lose. We're losing right now and something's really gotta give here. So, no Purell or anything similar to that you don't need to be sanitizing your hands every five minutes. No antibacterial soap in the bathroom, in the kitchen, or in your shower. The bacteria are our friends. <laughs> okay, so I kind of alluded to this earlier, but we gotta, we gotta dump the scented stuff. Most scents that you find in commercial packaging are chemical cocktails that are not human friendly. There's, there's no way around it. And when you spray an air freshener in your home, I don't care if the commercial shows the little droplet absorbing the odor and making it disappear, it's still there. It's just being covered up by chemicals. So the air that we breathe is very important and we don't need to be filling it with chemicals. This also applies to fabric softener. Uh, I saw an advertisement the other day. They said, you know, this fabric softener will keep your clothes smelling great for over 28 days. 
And all I could think was, wow, that must be a really persistent, powerful chemical. So people are starting to get wise to this, and just like with hygiene, there are lots of friendly products that can be used. Reach out to me if you need to know some specifics. But we really need to think about the little pine trees in our car, the Febreze and Glade and plug-ins and all these really, really sweet smelling chemicals. Candles, we got to get away from candles. Most candles will put some lead into the air that comes from the wick. So on top of the harsh chemical scents, you have lead. Uh, that's not the case 100% of the time, but it's very common. Um, we really got to rethink the number of chemicals that we're putting into the air and that we're wearing on ourselves every day that are being absorbed through our skin in the form of smell good fabric softeners and detergents. So I've had a number of people that I've worked with who suffer from asthma and allergies and just eliminating fabric softener from their laundry room completely turn things around. And so if you can make a simple step here and there for the better, then you'd be amazed at the results in your own health and the health of your family and your pets for that matter. So this is important for all Americans. Canadians, Mexicans, Europeans. It's important for anyone in a developed country. But I want to impart that it's especially important for us El Pasoans. So I love El Paso. I'm a native El Pasoan. I came back here after uh, living in many other places. I love El Paso, but El Paso carries with it an immense toxic burden. You need look no further than the skyline in the winter time to just see the most thick brown cloud hanging over our city. Um, there are a number of reasons for this, but the fact is here in El Paso we have to be very vigilant about chemical exposure because our environment is a little more toxic than most places. One of the only cities in the country that's exempt from EPA air quality standards. Uh, it's, it's rough here, air quality speaking, in El Paso. So if it's important for people in other parts of the country, it's especially important for us. One thing I want to mention, because I can see some people kind of glazing over, <laughs> is you don't have to do this all at once. You don't have to go in and clean out your medicine cabinet and get rid of all your makeup and perfume and deodorant and soap. And You don't have to just clean house and spend a bunch of money all at once to get this done. As you are replacing household products, be conscious about what you're buying and their chemical content and replace something nasty with something friendly. That's my advice. That's how I did it. That's how Marissa and I did it over time. Now, if you want to be gung-ho and just clean house and start over, that's great. But for most people, that's not practical. So my advice is, as you have to replace things, do so consciously. And have in the back of your mind some of the stuff that I'm talking about tonight. Okay, second thing. We have to eat real food. What do I mean by real food? Fresh, organic, local. Any question I get about how do we turn around our environmental problems in America, fresh, organic, local? How do we turn around the health picture of our country, fresh, organic, local? How do we feed a starving population? Americans are starving. We're, we're overfed and undernourished, and the way that we are going to turn it around, fresh, organic, local. Now, if you can't get it local, at least get it organic. Okay, and I'll talk about that in, in just a minute. Um, I want to give you guys a little bit of background on me before I start talking about agriculture. I have a background in agriculture. I have a degree in animal science. My emphasis was 
in production. So my education at Texas Tech was all about how to produce the most meat with the fewest animals and I was completely washed in the production ag river, so to speak. And I, I bought into it and I believed it and I lived it. So I, I, one of my jobs when I was at Texas Tech was working for the Agricultural Extension, Texas A&M, and I did agronomy experiments. So I would spend my Saturdays spraying chemicals on crops and hoping that I didn't breathe them. After I graduated, I worked for about a year for the world's largest protein producer, JBS, on a cattle feedlot. So for people who don't know what that is, that's what we call a confined animal feeding operation. There were 67,000 head of cattle on a little less than two square miles. That's a lot of cows in one place. And I lived this uh, experience. So I feel like I'm fairly well qualified to talk about the differences between conventional agriculture and organic ag agriculture. And I want you guys to know that I didn't always understand the things that I'm telling you about today. So, I mentioned fresh and local. Most importantly, we need to purchase organic and non-GMO food. Thankfully, people in many cases already understand this. 85% of American households buy organic produce. So the tide is already turning. Okay, Many, many of our food dollars are going towards organic food already. And that's a fantastic sign. So I feel like people are already on board. We just need to encourage that. And we need to think about how we're spending our money at the grocery store. Because just like the chemical issue, we can't wait for the legislators to help us with this. We need to vote with our dollars and we need to support people who are producing conscious, clean food. Uh, the whole argument over, well, you know, the chemicals are safe for us and Roundup is not bad for people and we have to have GMO crops to feed the world, it's nonsense. And it, I always laugh when they call it conventional agriculture because it has only existed since the 40s. So if organic and non-GMO have fed the human population for the entire history of the human race, then why all of a sudden in one generation can it not feed the world? It's an interesting question. Add to that the fact that most organic farms outproduce conventional farms two to one because they have healthy soil. There's a difference between soil and dirt, and anyone who has worked the land knows the difference. So, to put it very simply, if a chemical will kill a living plant or a living insect, how on earth? Could it be good for us? Because on a, on a foundational level, we're the same as a plant, as a weed, as an insect. When you get down to cells, it all works the same. So it kills them. It's okay for us. It's quite a disconnect there. And I think when people really sit down and think about this, they'll understand that no matter how many experts and papers you throw at me to try to convince me that pesticides and herbicides are okay for me to consume, I'm not buying it. Common sense tells me that if it kills a living thing in the form of a plant or insect, then it's not going to be good for me. So let's just get that out of the way and understand that conventional agriculture must disappear. Our, our health and our planet depends on that. And there are some really cool people who are pushing the envelope of conscious agriculture, permaculture, 
and humane, delicious livestock production. Uh, Joel Salatin is a brilliant guy. He runs a farm in Virginia. He speaks all over the country teaching farmers how to do what he's done, which is basically what his great-grandfather did. A farm where they grow a little of this and a little of that, and they have chickens and cows and they have pigs, and everybody works together for the health of the land. And it, it is possible, if you know someone old enough to have worked the land uh, pre-World War II, then they did it. Um, we don't have to go back that far in our history. It's really, really important. So we have to eat clean food and we have to cook real food. Most people know this, but I feel like it bears repeating. Sugar is the enemy. There is sugar hiding everywhere. It's unbelievable. You need to watch for sugar. So GMO beet sugar is the main source of sugar in our country. And the reason that that sugar is so darn toxic has to do with the, the way that a beet grows. So if you've ever seen a beet, it's beautiful, deep red color. It comes from all of the soil and all the minerals that the beet plant sucks from what it's growing in. If you are growing a beet in dirt that has been drenched with pesticides and herbicides, mostly Roundup, then all those chemicals are just being sucked up by that beet like a sponge. And then when we press the sugar from that beet, we're concentrating all those chemicals and then putting them in our food supply. So GMO beet sugar is one of the most toxic substances that I know of that people come into contact with. And it's more addictive than cocaine. If you've ever had a bowl of ice cream, you finished it, and I'm, I've, I've lived this, you have a bowl of ice cream, it tastes great, you set the bowl down, and you think, wow, I could go for another bowl of ice cream. That is because you are experiencing sugar addiction. And there's been some really interesting studies, uh, one of my favorites, they took a group of rats who they had addicted to cocaine and they gave these cocaine addicted rats the choice between sugar and cocaine and they picked sugar every single time. It's a well documented pathway that works the same as anything else that people get addicted to. Nicotine, uh, illicit drugs, what have you. Very, very highly addictive substance. It's not an accident that they put it in everything because they want you to buy it again. Junkies are easy to sell to. They are really easy to sell to. And the food companies know this. And it's a dirty secret that they work as hard as they can to make sure that you buy it again. Whether there's anything resembling food in that product or not, doesn't matter. As long as you purchase it and keep purchasing it, they're going to keep producing it. So, I'm not saying you have to cut sugar out completely. If you want to make some treats or have a cake or something for a special occasion, organic cane sugar. Sugar is supposed to come from sugar cane. Organic sugar cane makes good, pure sugar. So it doesn't have to be a complete cutout. Most people really need to drastically reduce their intake. But if you want some, make sure it's organic and it comes from sugar cane. So very available, really not that expensive. And if you're consuming less, then you can afford to buy a little bit more expensive sugar. So I want to talk for a minute about cooking as therapy. So. I always ask people, if, if you prepared a meal at home, do you know what went in there? And people mostly, yeah, I, I know, because I put it together. If you eat at a restaurant or a fast food joint, do you really know what's in there? No, 
You have no idea. You have to take their word for it. We need to slow down. We need to prepare meals at home so that we know what we're getting. And we need to really be sticklers about our ingredients. Uh, there's something very therapeutic about cooking dinner after a date, kind of help take your mind off of things. You get a real idea of um, what's going into your dish. It's a beautiful thing. And it's being lost at kind of an alarming rate in our country. Convenience trumps everything. And I always tell people that it's not just what you eat, it's how you eat it. What's your frame of mind when you eat that food? You can have the healthiest meal on the planet, but if you're stressed out, angry, worked up, on the run, you're not in a state to digest. You're mental state doesn't match your physical state. So we need to slow down. We need to gather around the dinner table and we need to rest and digest our food. So really important and a lot of people just don't understand that if you're going 100 miles an hour first thing in the morning, yes it's great that you've got a green smoothie that's healthy for you, but if you don't digest it, what's the point? Probably just wasted seven bucks on something you're not even gonna digest. <laughs> so we need to slow down. We need to think about how our mind is working while we So there's a big probiotic craze right now, and I'm not opposed to probiotics. Uh, there are many that work well. What a lot of people don't understand is that you can make this stuff at home. And traditionally, throughout history, people have been consuming probiotics because they fermented food. Before there were refrigerators, if you had a surplus of something and you wanted to keep it for more than a few days, then you needed to ferment it, you need to use bugs, basically bacteria and yeast, to preserve the food for us. So people feel like the probiotics are a new discovery and it's hot off the presses and our technology has reached a point where now we can give ourselves good bacteria, but what they don't understand is that this has been a part of human history since there's been humans. And it's really easy to bring it back. So if you don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on probiotics, then spend a couple of dollars on organic beets and make some beet boss. Or have some kefir. You can ferment almost anything in your kitchen. It's outrageously easy. The bugs do all the work for you. So I want to encourage you guys to experiment with some home fermentation. I think you'll really like it. Honestly, you probably have a couple in the beginning that don't turn out so good, but <laughs> it's just part of the experience. If you have kiddos, this is a great way to introduce them, even at a very young age, to the idea that there's an unseen kingdom around us at all times in the form of bacteria, yeast, fungus, viruses, that we live in harmony with for the most part. So you can use this as a way to teach and you can use cooking as therapy. So, really important. Get back in the kitchen. So my number one recommendation when it comes to diet, and it's always the same for, for almost everybody, join the Weston A. Price Foundation. Start to educate yourself on traditional diets and start experimenting with some of this stuff. A lot of the things that have been a part of human history since there have been humans have been lost in one generation. And I'm as guilty as anybody of some of this. I'm not a big liver eater. Not a big kidney eater. I've never had a brain sandwich. If you talk to my grandmother, these are staples in her house. And they're the healthiest part of the animal. We have 
fed the organs, which are the healthiest parts, to our, our pets, and given ourselves the beautiful steaks and roasts that are way less nutritious. So the dogs thank us, but we need to bring some of that back in ourselves. Um, the Wesson A. Price Foundation is all about educating. They do some great events. They have as much literature as you can you can pour over. Um, Forty dollars a year for a membership, and it's worth every penny. That's my number one recommendation. Um, I could spend literally hours going over all the things that I have learned and put into practice through being a part of this organization, but then you wouldn't have any reason to join. <laughs> so, always learning something new from them. And the story of Dr. Price is, is really amazing. So, I encourage you guys to look them up, join. It's very affordable, and your body will thank you. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about exercise. People know that they need to exercise, but what people don't often know is that it doesn't take near as much as you think. Um, a little bit every day, if you're not a big workout person, 20 minute walk in the morning, uh, 20 minute walk in the evening, maybe a little light stretching or some yoga, it's fantastic. You don't have to sweat buckets. You don't have to injure yourself and come see your chiropractor every day because <laughs> you're doing CrossFit. If anybody out there is watching, I don't have a problem with CrossFit. I have a problem with people hurting themselves over and over and over in an attempt to be healthy. So I, I love the gusto that I see a lot of times, but sometimes we need to rein that back a little bit and understand that a little light movement is oftentimes just as helpful as putting ourselves through the immense stress of a really strenuous boot camp workout. Okay, so it doesn't have to be uh, as, as hard as you think it is. A little sunshine, a nice brisk walk, and you're turning on thousands and thousands of protect, protective genes. So, gets a little bit into epigenetics, we won't cover that tonight, but basically, different things you do in your lifestyle switch on or switch off uh, your genetic code and there are many many protective genes in our genome and exercise turns on literally thousands of them so it's really important uh, but please don't exhaust yourself hurt yourself or go too wild uh, with exercise. It doesn't have to be near as strenuous as people have been led to believe. If you can do it outside, that's even better. A little sunshine goes a long way towards human health. So, sleep. This is something that I hear from people all the time. I don't get enough sleep. I'm in a funk because I slept poorly. Wow, Doc, I slept better than I've ever slept after my first adjustment. I hear about sleep a lot, and there are a lot of forces in our lives in modern society that are trying to rob us of sleep. So, basically, when you're sleeping, you're healing, and when you're sleeping, your brain literally cleans itself, so there's not enough room for everybody in the brain. And so when you turn off some parts of your consciousness, then you make room for the scrubbing, so to speak. It's really kind of amazing, and that's a new discovery uh, just recently. They always used to say that the brain didn't have any drainage or lymphatics, and the truth is, they're there, they just share space, and when you're awake, your consciousness wins. When you're asleep, your brain is able to take time to clean. And so one of the theories out there now is that is why, that's why we sleep, is because we need time for our brain to clean and basically give our brain's sewer system time to operate. So sleep is really important. If you want to sleep better, eating well will help you. 
Exercising will help. Avoiding blue light, and by blue light I mean cell phones, tablets, laptops, televisions, uh, LED, track lighting. The, the list of blue light gets longer and longer every day. And it's, it's interesting to me because LED lights are so cheap that they have put them everywhere, even in places we don't need them. You, you turn off the lights in a typical American bedroom and there's dozens of blinking LED lights all over the place. That is telling your brain it's time to wake up. Blue light is the morning spectrum. It literally drags you up out of bed and gets you going. So if you're checking your phone one last time right before you put, it, put your head down, then you're sending mixed messages. The light is telling your brain to wake up, and you're telling your brain you need to try to go to sleep. So my recommendation is to uh, put your phone in the other room, avoid any uh, temptation to check it right before you go to bed, check it in the middle of the night when you wake up. Just, just let yourself have that time to decompress and rest. So the blue light is huge. And a lot of times I tell people who want to know how to sleep better, and they don't like to hear it. They, they love to check their phone right before they go to bed. I'm sorry. All I can do is try. So blue light is huge. <laughs> Fifth thing, starting to wrap things up. And as I mentioned, I, I, for me personally, I think this is the most important thing. And that's having a, a spiritual foundation through which you can understand the world. And so... You know, lots of different cultures have communicated this in different ways, but there's a universal knowledge that we need to be connected to the source of the energy that's in our universe. And so your, your life is lived through your perception, and the way that you view yourself as a being is going to influence that lens. So, there are some really wacky things out there in the world today, and if you don't have a way to understand it, then you're a ship without an anchor. <laughs> so, where did all this come from? I have adapted this talk from the teachings of Dr. Palmer. He was the founder of chiropractic. And in the late 1800s, he laid out the three T's. These three things work to either create wellness or illness. Trauma, toxins, and thoughts. And no, I didn't misspell that. He misspelled it, and I carry his spelling over. <laughs> so, trauma can be physical. You know, people think about that, broken arms, broken legs, car wrecks, falls from roofs, whatever. On the other hand, you have exercise, which is a healthy stress and kind of the positive end of trauma. Toxins, we talked about chemicals ad nauseum tonight. Uh, really, really big influence on our health these days. And on the flip side, if you're getting good nutrition from clean, real food, then you're able to counteract some of that toxic burden. The third one is thoughts. Uh, we literally instruct all 70 trillion cells through our thoughts. We don't have to speak it. Our cells hear what we're thinking, and they pick up on that. And when you think about it, nobody likes to be around a crab. A grouch, someone who's always negative, why would your cells want to be around that? Why would your gut microbiota want to be around someone who's always cranky? And so when we're talking about the difference between people who survive something strenuous and people who succumb and pass away, a lot of times it boils down to their mindset, their attitude. And what kind of instructions are you giving your cells? So, Dr. Palmer knew this in the late 1800s, and he based my profession off of these three things. 
the more research that's done and the more we understand human physiology, the more that he is proved right. Over and over and over he's proved right. So it's really that simple. So the last thing I'll talk about very briefly is chiropractic care. Um, your nervous system controls every aspect of your human experience. And if it's not working properly, then the function of your body suffers. So chiropractic is more than just for car wrecks. It is part of a healthy lifestyle. People always say, well, I don't want to go to a chiropractor because then I'll have to go the rest of my life. And I'd say, well, does that keep you from going to the gym? You go to the gym one time, you have to go to the gym the rest of your life? No, you don't have to. Of course you don't have to. You eat one organic meal and all of a sudden you have to eat organic food the rest of your life? No. It's part of a healthy lifestyle. It's part of prevention and wellness. So when we want to talk about true health care, 95% of true health care is what you're doing day in and day out for yourself. 5% is what your doctor, your chiropractor, your acupuncturist, your massage therapist, your physical therapist, whoever. That's what they're doing for you. Most of the responsibility for being healthy lies with you. And you get a little help from your friends here and there to, to bring things along. So I'll wrap it up with that. I hope that you guys have enjoyed this. I hope that you've gotten some practical tips. And if you have any questions or any concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. So thank you guys for your time and your attention. And good evening.